Welcome everyone. My name is Dana White. Today, the Myth Salon has the pleasure of launching a new series, Pulling Focus, with the film Infinite Potential, The Life and Ideas of Physicist Philosopher David Bohm. Will and I are extremely grateful to Corinne Bordeaux for pulling this project together for us. We are especially pleased to have the film's director, Paul Howard, participating with us today, live from Ireland. In addition, one of the film's interviewed participants, David Edmund Moody, will be joining the panel that is being moderated by Trina Wyatt. Thank you, everyone. Okay, hi everybody, it's Corinne Bordeaux. Um, many of you recognize me from the salon, so I'm thrilled to be here tonight. I'm not actually um, introducing the panelists, I'm introducing Trina Wyatt, who is our, our incredible moderator, and she'll be introducing uh, the panelists. But so without any further ado, um, Trina is actually a very uh, wonderful and trusted colleague of mine. Um, she is the uh, a visionary in this whole world of spiritual and social change media, a true visionary. She uh, is the co-founder of the Tribeca Film Festival, and I'm also super excited to announce she's a recent addition and artistic director to the Esalen Film Festival. Uh, Trina is also the founder of CEO of Conscious Good. It's a community-driven media platform where entertainment fuels personal growth and collective transformation. If you have a chance, she has extraordinary content. It is just fantastic. And you can sign up for Conscious Good streaming channel, See Good TV on Amazon, Apple. It's currently free and without advertising. And it's just a delightful platform. Um, so, and also joining us on the panel tonight is another familiar face, Will Lynn. Uh, PhD myth from Pacifica and also uh, teaches and co-chairs at the Hussein College on mythology. Um, so uh, without any further ado, I'm gonna have Trina go ahead and introduce the, the panel. We'll start with um, some Q&A and we'll of course welcome uh, questions from the audience as well. And thanks so all much for joining. Well, thank you, Corinne, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Dana and Will for um, having me join you this evening for this wonderful event. It's a tremendous honor. Uh, so I'm very excited to introduce our panelists. Um, first, it is such a privilege to introduce David Edmund Moody, who is the author of Krishnamurti in America, New Perspectives on the Man and His Message. Uh, David previously wrote an uncommon collaboration David Bohm and Krishnamurti, which examines the whole scope of the relationship between the two men, including their many dialogues uh, and personal interactions. Moody is the former director of the Oak Grove School, which was founded by Krishnamurti, and elementary and secondary school um, in Ojai, California. Uh, so welcome, uh, David. Thank you, thank you so much. And you should mention that your own children are now attending the Oak Grove School. I Yes, absolutely. And we couldn't be happier that our kids are there. It's really um, an amazing institution. So thank you for your work there. And next, I'd like to introduce Taria Ward, who has a PhD in depth psychology from Pacifica. Uh, nearly 30 years ago, Taria trained with the Dialogus, Dialogus Foundation, which is out of MIT, learning the theories, method, and practice of the dialogue technique developed by Bohm. For many years, uh, Taria taught this method to groups and organizations around the world. She has worked as a minister and she is the founder of Bridging Worlds Mountain Retreat Center. Uh, so welcome, Taria. Thank you so much, Trina. Thank you. It's just a delight to be here with all of you. Okay, next I'm gonna introduce, uh, well, Corinne doesn't really need an introduction, <laughs> but I will anyway, um, my esteemed colleague and dear friend, uh, Corinne Bordeaux is the president and founder of 360 Degree Communications, which is a leading entertainment marketing firm. Under her leadership, uh, 360 has worked on numerous films, including the Academy Award-winning films, Free Solo, The Cove, Boyhood, The Biggest Little Farm, Infinite Potential, and many others. Corinne is also, as you know, the founder and director of the Esalen Film Festival. So thank you, Corinne. Last but not least, certainly not least, 
really excited to introduce all of you to the accomplished filmmaker, Paul Howard, who is the director and producer of Infinite Potential. Over the past 30 years, Paul's has work, Paul has worked internationally across most disciplines in the film and television industries as a director, producer, and writer covering genres such as uh, natural history, biographies, and the arts and science. Welcome, Paul. Hi, Trina. Wonderful to see you again. And I just can't wait to get back to Ojai. So please invite yes. me sometime. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. I have a guest room waiting for you. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I'd like to say, start out by saying thank you to Paul for making this, this incredible film, which is so powerful and entertaining and in, in, uh, instructional um, as well. Uh, so I'd like to start off first by asking Paul, what inspired you to tell this story? Well, um, that's, a, that's a great question. And uh, first of all, I'd just like to say that um, uh, the film is, uh, has amazed me too, um, you know, just in the way that people have responded to it. Um, uh, lots of people have told me that they've uh, viewed the film numerous times and that they're, they actually feel after the first time uh, they see it that they want to see it again. You know, and one of, one of the things as a filmmaker that um, I always like uh, um, in films I make is not to tie everything up nicely at the end. I always li like to leave people with a kind of a, a sense of mystery about things. Now, just to answer your question, what was it that inspired me? Well, um, I may have told this story to you before, but you know, um, ever since I was very young, I always had a very deep intuitive sense uh, that there was something underlying the reality, our normal everyday manifest reality of three dimensional space and time. And actually that came out of my early interest in cinema, because every time I used to go into a theater, and I, the lights would go down and uh, uh, the projector would run and you'd be totally immersed in another reality, a two-dimensional reality up on the screen. And I always found it a very, very strange uh, feeling when the lights came back on and you drift out back on into the street and this sense that you are coming from a two-dimensional world back into a three-dimensional world and I had this uh, idea from a very early age that um, uh, maybe the world we live in, our manifest reality, is a kind of a projection from another world. So, so my interest, if you like, in the deeper order, uh, Bohm calls it the quantum Im implicate order, um, I think I had a very uh, uh, deep intuition that there was something something beyond our everyday world. So I had a very accidental meeting, but in some ways I kind of say not accidental. I think I was uh, somehow pushed. I think it was the quantum potential that was pushing me uh, towards, towards this meeting um, that I had with David Pete in Italy. I just strolled into this little village one day and he was sitting in a cafe bar, completely empty. And I went to order a cappuccino uh, he noticed my uh, Irish accent and he came over to help me because he knew my Italian wasn't very good. And then I, I noticed his Liverpudlian accent. So we were almost neighbors, you know, because uh, a lot of Irish people went to uh, Liverpool. Um, so it was only uh, much later that I learned that uh, David Peach was an associate of David Bohm. Uh, David Pete himself being a quantum physicist. And when he learned I was a filmmaker, he started to talk to me about David Bohm. Now, I was very, very attracted initially to the philosophical aspects of David Bohm. Um, you know, the, the, the concepts of wholeness and interconnectivity. Um, and um, it was, Again, some time later, when I started to take it more seriously, that um, when I started to look into the physics of David Bohm, I could see that these, these weren't just ideas, but they were ideas that were firmly grounded in uh, physics and in mathematics. So it wasn't just another kind of 
new age idea about consciousness or in our interconnectivity or wholeness. Um, uh, there were ideas that were deeply rooted in physics. So I could see how Bohm's ideas of wholeness and uh, his philosophical ideas emerged from his physics. And, you know, they gave them a very solid foundation for me. So I felt I was on solid ground here. And I think then that the philosophical ideas that I was attracted to um, became a much more kind of worthy exercise to explore for me as a filmmaker. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Paul. Um, well, I want to ask Corinne, uh, since we're speaking about the film in particular, you know, you've, you've been the, the brain trust behind the marketing of this film to a broad audience. Um, what were some of the challenges that you faced in marketing this film? Uh, well, thanks, Trina. And, and there has been a team. I have to tell you, it is an extraordinary team effort. Um, but that being said, one of the interesting challenges right off the bat was, um, you know, it's a film about a physicist who's been dead for a while. You know, we had just come off of Free Solo, which won an Academy Award. We had, you know, guys, you know, all these kind of big, heavy films with timely topical. And here we had this beautiful film, but, uh, and, and I realized at the beginning when I was talking to people, their eyes would kind of glaze over because they might not know who uh, David Bohm is or they, he's been dead who is he so and also the you know the dreaded biopic pitch we wanted to avoid that right but what really helped us is that paul crafted this beautiful film and i'm not just saying this because he's here but the best tool we had was when people watched it mm. you know i would describe the film i tried to make it sound as beautiful and wonderful as i could because it is but when people watched it, that's what changed everything. We had somebody up at Esalen that saw it, Ira Israel, and he called me the following day and said, every single person needs to see this film. And I said, great, <laughs> great, come on board. And that's the kind of grassroots effort it truly was. Because, and I can say this now because it's been a huge success and people are loving it, but it could have fallen into the dry bio doc. Oh, that's just a doc about a physicist. So that was our challenge. Um, and it was quite frankly solved by if people saw the film. I don't think I had one, it's the first time I can say I've worked on a film ever where I have had not had one negative feedback. Amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. And it's true. And so, so no negative responses, but um, kind of just because this is such a unique film and it, I'm sure it didn't hurt that you had, you know, the His Holiness, the Dalai Lama saying Bohm was his, you know, physicist and um, obviously his relationship with Krishnamurti. Uh, but what, as, as you have been working on this film, what sort of changes have occurred that you've noticed um, as more people are seeing it? Well, you know, that's actually a great question and it never hurts to have the Dalai Lama in a film or supporting a film. And we did one of our first events. But I think for me, the most interesting change has been that as um, Paul was mentioning earlier, people have seen this film two, three, four times mm -hmm. and that one for me, one of the biggest changes and what I felt really helped the campaign is people had that fervent, fervent. Um, uh, Ira Israel wrote in his article, this is the most important film ever made. That was the first sentence of his article. I said, but good. You know, if people have that kind of fervent, people must see this film and they were sharing it. So that mm -hmm. to me is the biggest change because people are changed when they see the film. Yes. The film is so stunningly beautiful. It's, it's a game changer. It's a life changer for people to see that. So you really don't have to do, you know, I worked on the Cove and we did a whole big thing about saving the dolphins and all that social action. There was really no social action here. It was watch this incredible film and then share it. Yes. So that's what happened. And uh, we we're lucky to say, you know, it just took off. It took off beyond anyone's wildest belief. Absolutely. And there were, there was, um, uh, some surprises in the the narrative of the film in terms of sort of some of the challenges Baum had faced in his lifetime that I felt were um, universal, you know, that we could all relate to. So uh, as somebody who's, you know, scared of physicist, uh, you know, physics, I didn't even take a course in school to, it was so approachable and, and, and Baum really was, um, 
a very accessible and, and relatable uh, for his journey. Um, so thank you, Corinne. I want to uh, talk to David. I want to ask David a question because um, to me, it's just absolutely remarkable that you've got, you were able to spend time in the presence of Krishnamurti and David Bohm, um, which I'm sure so many of us are, are quite envious of you for that ability. Um, so if, I, I want to be able to talk to you uh, uniquely about the, um, their theories and some of their dialogue. Um, in some opinions, or I've, I've read and heard that Bohm's greatest contribution to humanity is this theory of non-locality, the theory that thought is distributed and non-localized just as quantum entities are. And I've heard that Krishnamurti's greatest contribution might be considered the observer is the observed, you know, summing it up, you know, very succinctly. Um, do you feel that these were uh, their greatest contributions? Well, Krishnamurti's greatest contribution was not only that central insight about the observer and the observer, but he had a very, very comprehensive philosophy. He had a very comprehensive and detailed, uh, you might say, vision or perception of human psychology. You know, Krishnamurti is often thought of as a spiritual teacher or a religious figure. And there was that dimension to his work, but the, really the center of gravity, the primary thrust of his teaching had to do with uh, just ordinary, everyday, human psychology, the, the dynamics of the way your mind works and the way my mind works, and the uh, sort of illusions that we are all subject to, and uh, above all the conflicts that many of us experience, both inwardly within ourselves and conflicts with other people, conflicts between nations. These uh, very practical, down-to-earth, daily life kinds of issues were the thrust of his philosophy. And the observers, the observed is, was kind of a central insight of his, but you, you can't really understand fully what, you, what he meant by that unless you take it in the context of the uh, whole um, field of, of understanding of the human uh, mind that he developed. As far as Bohm is concerned, uh, the idea that, uh, you know, thought is distributed, uh, you might say. You said non-local, which is a term which uh, really applies more to his quantum physics, actually. Mm -hmm. But it, it does have an applicability to uh, his ideas about the psychological field, because yes, Bohm's, uh, Bohm's one book in the field of human psychology is called Thought as a System. And the, one of the fundamental thrusts of that book uh, is that, um, yes, thought, the, the thinking process, it's not like just I have my thoughts and you have your thoughts and they're, you know, just in our own private domain. But he said thought is a system, thought flows uh, between and among individuals. He said culture is a matter of um, what he calls shared meaning. And culture breaks mm -hmm. down when we don't have a, a shared meaning in common, as is very, um, you know, uh, conspicuous in, in uh, today's modern world, which is so highly polarized. And uh, so the, the sharing of thought was, again, it was one feature of Bohm's understanding of human psychology, but he too, like Krishnamurti, had a very, very comprehensive and very well-developed view of ordinary human psychology, not the kind of thing that you would think of as religious or spiritual necessarily, but just down to earth dynamics of, uh, of our minds as we live uh, in our present life. Yes, absolutely. I, I think it's so remarkable that, you know, both of these uh, gentlemen had uh, such an understanding of psychology and yet they weren't um, scholars per se in the area of psychology, right? Um, unlike Taria, <laughs> um, who, who is, uh, you know, a doctor of psychology. And so I'm so eager to get uh, your viewpoint. Um, so Taria, I understand that you developed a college course called The Physics of Thought and it's based on Bohm's theories. 
Um, can you share your experiences in teaching this course? Oh, I would love to. Um, I'm so glad about what David was saying about Bohm's book, the, the uh, thought as a system and right. the book on dialogue. These were the textbooks in the course that I taught. Great. Yes, and it was, it was quite a privilege to teach it. And I have to give due honor to Dana White, who was the person who saw that I was teaching this in a variety of organizations. And he called me up, he was an administrator in, uh, at the Art Institute of Los Angeles. And he said, I think that we could teach this under the auspices of critical thinking. And so it was right. his sort of visionary idea that I could bring the dialogue work into a course, a college level course on critical thinking. And I called it the physics of thought. But it was, it was a beautiful thing to be in Los Angeles where there are, is such diversity. So in my classrooms, I would have a classroom of maybe mm, 30 to 40 people. There would be maybe 10 or 12 different nations represented around the world, as well as all the different, it was an art school. So there were um, people from, Beverly Hills and people from South Central LA and, you know, people who wanted to study art, but very different socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds. So I got them into conversation, into the dialogue work, which is about understanding the nature of thought and how it is that actually, as Bohm said, thought thinks us. We think that we are the author of our thoughts, but he was able to articulate and explain how thought is embedded in the explicate order and it comes into us and and we are not the author of our thoughts and, and once you can understand that you can the observer and the observed that that phenomena kicks into place where you can actually change your thinking but it's very hard he talked about the instincts of the jungle that we bring to the defense of our thoughts it's, it's quite a process, the dialogue process. It's just brilliant. But I had people from all over the world, such different backgrounds, people who were ready to fight and kill for, you know, that like the ones in South Central LA, if you didn't do what they said to do in their world and you crossed the street over here, you could actually get killed. And, and I had kids that were tagging around LA and people who were thinking that that was just wrong and bad and everybody getting into conversation together it was just amazing well when we used the methodology that Bohm developed of respect of listening of suspending our assumptions of really understanding the thought that's thinking us instead of us thinking the thoughts it was amazing and that's when the it's like the implicate order started to become apparent and the fact that we were all connected, that everyone was, it was really basically coming from the same place, that we all lived in the same atmosphere, um, that, and the separateness between us was, um, I had kids who said, can I bring my mother to this class? Can I bring my girlfriend to this class? Can I bring my friends to this class? It, was, um, it was, wasn't the class you skipped, it was the ones that you brought your friends and your, your people to so that they could understand how these processes work. Beautiful stories that I have from teaching that um, method. That's amazing. And what years were these? This was back in, it would have been, I, I moved out of Los Angeles in 2004. So it was between 2000, 2004, around in well, those years. Yeah. Would you, um, what about teaching this again now? It seems like it's needed now more than ever, um, possibly online. Could we persuade you to do that? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, I would be thrilled to. I, you know, my course is on those little floppy disks. I don't even know. It's like, how do I get, maybe Will can tell me, how do you get from floppy disk onto, you know, I, it's amazing. All the course material is. Who, writes, who, who knows how to do it? That's, that's your hope. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll come back to that, but. Well, uh, I'm sure Carol, I can develop it again. I mean, easily because it's all uh, in me. I just love it all. Yes. And I've worked with it ever since. Yes. Paul and I just, raising his yeah, hand. I, I just want to make one point, you know, because uh, it's interesting uh, how the conversation there is going about the nature of thought. Bohm 
uh, uh, says that beyond our everyday thoughts are the deep, is the deeper thought of mankind. The deeper thought of mankind. And this is also echoed in his physics because um, uh, Bohm describes the entire system as a single wave function. So it's completely undivided. And within that single wave function, you have the local and you have the non local. You've got the local emerging from the non local, you've got the implicate becoming explicate. Um, undivided wholeness. So um, you can see how interconnectivity plays into all of this. And, you know, the great lesson here really is that, um, you know, because we are all interconnected, the moral really is that if I hurt you, I'm hurting myself. Mm -hmm. You know, if I, damage, if I damage the earth, I'm damaging myself. Okay. You know, so there are big lessons here for the world today, and they they go right across the physics, they go right across the philosophical aspects, and they go right into the the dialogue as we've just been hearing. Yes, well, well said, Paul. Very well said. I want to take a a question from uh, David to the panelists, and maybe um, David. Uh, Edmund Moody can answer this. Um, there seems to have been a falling out between Bohm and Krishnamurti late in their relationship. Um, what in their dynamic changed? Was it a disagreement about the nature of reality? No, there, there, there was nothing. There was nothing of that nature. Actually, there were two episodes of difficulty in their relationship. You have to understand that Bohm and Krishnamurti were close collaborators for 25 years. They really had uh, quite a strong connection. So I'm going to describe two uh, episodes in which they had conflict, but those conflicts need to be seen in the broader context of a, a really remarkably um, cooperative and close relationship for many years. But there were two areas of difficulty. At one point, the two men had completed a series of dialogues, 12 dialogues. This was the first extended series of recorded dialogues they had. And uh, Bohm was very, very invested in this and he was very much looking forward to the publication of those dialogues. For Krishnamurti, it was important and interesting, but it didn't have quite the priority for him that it had for Bohm. And just before those dialogues were about to be published, uh, one of the uh, closest people to Krishnamurti, uh, his, his primary biographer, Mary Lutchens, who was uh, um, a lifelong friend of his, she objected very strongly to the publication of the dialogues for various reasons. And as a result, this book, which uh, would have published all 12 of the dialogues, was pulled at the last minute, and only some short excerpts were uh, were published at that time. Bohm was very disappointed in this, and he there was a period of time where he felt it reflected on a Krishnamurti personally. But Krishnamurti promised they would have another series of dialogues that would in fact be published in full, and that did take place. Uh, that's the series of dialogues called The Ending of Time, which is uh, really the kind of the pinnacle of their relationship. and. Uh, to a large extent, I think that that kind of healed the little rift which had developed. But later on, uh, right near the end of, uh, of um, Krishnamurti's life, after the two men had been collaborating for more than 20 years, there, there came another episode, and it's not entirely clear what happened, but the evidence seems to indicate that Krishnamurti questioned whether Bohm's understanding of his philosophy was really uh, deeply insightful or more intellectual. And at the same time, it seems that Krishnamurti wanted Bohm to commit himself more fully to, to his understanding of the psychological field. And this was evidently quite disturbing to Bohm. Um, uh, what I'm telling you is, is based a lot on inference. We don't really know the facts altogether. 
Uh, this took place after Bohm had had uh, extensive heart surgery, which uh, probably affected his uh, emotional stability to some extent. And after Krishnamurti died, I think Bohm uh, recovered from all of that. Um, in, in my book, An Uncommon Collaboration, there's an appendix where I interviewed Bohm and discussed with him the whole scope of his uh, feeling about Krishnamurti, the quality of their relationship, how he assessed Krishnamurti's role in the world. And in that dialogue, you see no trace of, of any of this discord, which, uh, which did crop up on a couple of occasions. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable also for the collaboration over a period of 25 years in any relationship to, of that duration and, in, and intensity to think that there isn't going to be a couple little bumps um, along the way is, uh, I think, a little um, idealistic. <laughs> um, I want to go to a question from our attendees, and I think this one is perfect for uh, the individual on our panel who has actually been a minister. The beloved Dennis Slattery, who is an esteemed, esteemed, and highly well-respected professor at our university. Perfect. Uh, so Yes, not just from anyone, uh, but <laughs> sorry, I had to give that pitch. He's just amazing. He's amazing. Wonderful. Well, great. Um, that gives like context. And I found it, Corinne. Oh, go ahead. Take it yeah. Away. So no, but I love that. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure Dennis thanks you. Dennis is saying that the conversation makes him think about the power of prayer, praying for others, where something of goodwill and compassion is carried through ether. Uh, can you respond to this? Where, where something of the of the prayer energy is carried through ether. I, I nope. now Dennis is on. Does he want to say more about this? I mean, I, I'm confused. I, I'm happy to go with this, but if Dennis wants to, he may have more to say. Well, Mark just the uh, thank you, Taria. I'm, I'm still working on your name. You were a student of mine many years ago, and uh, I loved every minute of you being in the classroom. Aww. And the beloved um, and esteemed part is very true. <laughs> thank you. Well, I'm, I'm just kind of going with the analogies that are coming up for me, not only uh, during the time that I watched the film and took uh, pages of notes and just let my mind free flow with what I was hearing, but just listening to the conversation uh, this evening, it felt like there was a, a deeper way for me, for us, to think about the power of prayer, not only as a way to liberate oneself from self-absorption, but also to connect, I don't know if I'm using the language correctly, but on a quantum level with others who are going through an emotional challenge or a physical challenge or a tremendous loss in their lives. And I just thought I would put that out and see if any of you would like to uh, further that or offer any response that uh, comes to you. Thank you. So I'll be glad to take that and then see what, what anybody else has to say. But it, it reminds me of what um, Bohm does say about thought being something that is actually in our matter, that thought goes out and it, it affects the brain. We, it comes in and it affects even the chemistry in our brain. So, so my thought is based on uh, what Dennis is, uh, is articulating there is that prayer certainly would go out in this kind of field of what, the way thought affects us and that it would have an effect, that it would, could be have an observable something that that comes comes from the ex implicate order into the explicate order through the power of our thinking and and certainly with the heart energy that goes with prayer and you know whatever else is involved in in uh the energy that goes out in in prayer form so i think bohm's ideas about thought would say that that prayer would have that impact in the explicate order Beautiful. Anyone else would like to comment on that? Well, you know, Bohm, um, he does talk about um, uh, deeply conditioned thought and prejudice as actually being trapped in the body itself. 
um, that it becomes part of our individual uh, pain bodies and it becomes part of a collective pain body, which is basically what we inherit from the time we actually come into the world, uh, from our parents, from the communities, from perhaps uh, um, uh, uh, years of um, oppression or wars or uh, global conflicts. So there's an individual kind of pain body there is a collective pain body which operates at a community, national and global level. And um, part of the dialogue experience is to actually unlock that, uh, to, to um, become aware of your thoughts uh, in the same way that you can close your eyes and you become aware of where your, your fingers and your arms and your legs and so on are. You can actually develop uh, the ability to actually watch your thoughts. So instead of binging out on Netflix, you can actually binge out on your own thoughts. <laughs> well said. Paul, it sounds a lot like um, Eckhart Tolle and when he talks about the pain body. And I know he was in Britain at one time. It'd be interesting to, to know if there is some connection there between Eckhart and, um, and David Bohm. Well, actually, um, Eckhart, Eckhart does um, uh, talk about Krishnamurti a lot, and he actually reads passages from uh, Krishnamurti's works, and I've heard him read uh, passages. But yes, you're quite right. Eckhart Tolle would express the same kind of ideas about, you know, watching the thinker and being aware of our thoughts and creating the space between our thoughts where new perception can arise. So... Paul, while I have you, um, if you, like David, um, David uh, Moody, was in a room with Bohm and Krishnamurti, what would you ask them? Is there anything that you would have liked to have included in the film? Well, <laughs> well the funny thing is that, uh, um, you know, I didn't know anything about David Bohm until relatively recently. And I was actually quite shocked that I hadn't heard of this man. You know, the man that Einstein called his spiritual son and the Dalai Lama called his, his science guru. And, you know, growing up, um, I used to sit around dinner tables and at tea time. And I had a father who was very interested in, in science. Uh, he was an airline pilot. So he had, I suppose, a, a kind of a, a leaning towards science and mathematics and things like that. But, you know, I heard of Einstein and I heard of Stephen Hawking and I heard of Niels Bohr. And it was only later I kind of thought, um, how come I never heard of Bohm? So I guess the first question I'd ask Bohm is, how come I never heard about you? <laughs> um, no, I, it's a, that's a very difficult question. Um, what would I actually say to them if I, if I was in a room with them? Mm -hmm. I think uh, one of the joys for me in making this film uh, was perhaps the fact that I hadn't known Bohm and hadn't heard about him. So it was a complete journey of discovery for me in a way. And I think also the fact that I'm not a physicist and I had to kind of uh, go at this subject with a kind of a childlike wonder mm -hmm. and try and unravel and decode the physics for a wider audience. Um, I think that that was the great joy for me in making this film. And because I think visually, I tend to think in visual terms. I think that's why I think I was able to express this in a very visual way um, uh, in the film. And I think that that has kind of resonates, that resonates with people. Finding a way to decode the implicate order and the, the deeper quantum world and give people a sense of spatial relationships uh, in terms of manifest reality and the lack of spatial relationships within the quantum world. So that was one of the big challenges uh, for me. But had I been a physicist, I think it would have been a very different film. Uh, I, I can understand why you would say that. Thank you. Um, so I want to ask uh, uh, David on... You know, Bohm proposes that when there is a great crisis, people are momentarily able to drop their customary patterns of thinking and behavior. But when the crisis is over, they go back to their familiar ways. 
Um, obviously, right now we're in a very uh, a, a great crisis. We're in a crisis with COVID and politics. How would David um, advise us during these times? What can we apply here? I think that what uh, Bohm would be most concerned about um, is, you know, what I something I mentioned a little bit earlier is the extreme uh, polarization of our society. Um, it's not merely the fact that we have this um, virus which is affecting all of us. The problem is more cultural, and that is that we uh, have these two poles who view the virus in, in such different ways, and not only the virus, that view everything in such different ways. It's almost as if we have, we, our society is, uh, occupies two different, uh, entirely different worlds with very little communication between them. Uh, that, I think, is, is what would get Bohm's attention and what he would want to address uh, through the process of dialogue and in other ways. I wonder if I could also go back briefly to the question you raised a minute ago. What, what would I say if I had a chance to uh, talk with these men? Um, th this is something which comes up in my life frequently because I spend a great deal of time with both men and during the course of my daily life, it's very, very often that issues arise and I think, oh my God, why didn't I ask them when I had them? Why didn't I ask them? If I had to do over again, I'm pretty sure, and I just had one chance, I would ask them both more directly than I did in real life about themselves. Because I asked Bohm many times, I said, why don't you write a book which expresses your understanding of the psychological field. You know, as we mentioned, we have this one book, Thought as a System, but that's just the transcript of a, a seminar. It's a very, um, it's a dialogue with a group of 50 people. And he never set out to systematically express all of his views in the psychological field as a book. And I said, why, I, many times I said to him, why don't you do that? And he would tell me, it's because my understanding is not complete yet. I don't mm -hmm. understand it fully. And if I had it to do over again, I would press him on that. I would say, <laughs> why? You know, what is it? Let, let's go into What's it. What's missing? What is it? Yeah, what is it you don't understand. Because when you talk about it, it sounds like you understand everything. But if you think something's missing, what is it? I had a similar conversation with Krishnamurti. But he didn't say that he didn't understand everything. <laughs> he, said, he said that um, I asked Krishnamurti if, uh, if he ever had a sense of the ego, a sense of self-identity, and then had to break out of that. Or if he always, if he never had a sense of ego. And he said, you know, I hardly ever had any sense of it. Maybe mm. just a little bit, but hardly ever. And that too, I would have liked to pursue. I would have liked to say, what do you mean by that? You had it a little bit, but not that much. Great, <laughs> oh, those are great questions we can ponder. <laughs> yeah. um, so, Taria, I wanted to ask you, how can Bohm's theories have the potential to resolve the fragmentation that we've been talking about among humans, as well as resolve the, uh, the separation between humans and the rest of creation? Wow, what a beautiful question. Um, in terms of resolving the fragmentation, um, I think that the study of dialogue um, and the pr practice and practice, practice, practice of dialogue um, has the capacity to help us as humans to resolve the fragmentation among each other. Um, I, I, uh, I, I know that there's a when I taught it, when I have taught it and been deeply in dialogue, was in dialogue circles where just we all practiced together um, for a lot of years. And there's a visceral sensation that you get that's beyond thought, where all of a sudden you do recognize the, the, the absolute continuity and coherence among each other. And, and it's, it's something that can't be explained. It can only be felt and experienced it that way. And I, and I, it's like, I wrote a big long article in my dissertation called Dialogue as Ritual. It's almost like it's a ritual that what you enter and you stay with it because it's hard. 
Um, but when you stay with it, you start to get that sense and it gets into your cells. It gets into you in a way that I think then once you have that experience, you can't operate in a different way where you, where separation is as, um, uh, as, as big uh, an idea or problem as it used to be. So I would say, I wish that every family, I wish children, I wish in grade school, I wish the, the process of dialogue would be taught and experienced. Um, so That's I think awesome. that, that, yeah. And in terms of um, what you're, the second part of your question in, in terms of the other more than human world, mm -hmm. I mean, I, that is an extension of this experience, but I feel like the indigenous way of, of in the tribes that still exist, they get together in the morning and they all share their thoughts with one another and they share their dreams with one another. Um, and so when, when, and that's how they know how to live. Once they've heard from everyone, not just the top down, you know, ideas of how we're going to conduct our day, but once they've heard from absolutely everyone in the village, that's how it was all conducted. But it was, it was, um, the way that they lived, it's the, the voices that came in were dreams, were the more than human world, the, you know, the animals that were addressing them, you know, the, the, the way the winds and the smells and all of that was, were, were connected. So that uh, field of information and conversation was so apparent to them. So I, I just feel like the dialogue work to me, when I studied it, when I experienced it back in 1993 at the Parliament of the World's Religions, um, I thought, this is it. This is the thing. This is the mm -hmm. thing that can lead us out of, you know, the, the terrible difficulty that we're in. Um, yes. And do you think that film, that visual stories could also be vehicles for resolving this fragmentation? Visual stories? Yeah, films or, or visual storytelling. Well, just exactly what Paul was saying. I loved his story. I think that might have been before everybody else was here, but he, he talked about, or, or, or maybe not, but uh, about how cinema, um, you know, it's like all those voices coming together um, certainly helped him to um, enter the field of coherence rather than fragmentation. Um, so absolutely. You're, you're I, can I, can I just make a, a point on that? I think your question, Trina, was uh, addressing the issue of separation. Now, when you actually dive into bone at the very deep level, you realize that actually we misperceive reality, manifest reality, through our sensory perception. And at the deeper quantum level, there is no separation. So, so actually, there is no separation between us all, um, we, we have to go beyond manifest form, duality, to realize this interconnection. And there is no separation at the deeper quantum level. And it's out of the deeper quantum level that we actually emerge into, into this reality that we actually, we think we're separate, but we're actually not separate. And it's a bit like what I was saying earlier, um, you know, and Bohm has addressed this himself, that when, you know, we damage another or hurt another, ultimately we're hurting ourselves. It's the same with the prejudices that we hold, the comments that we might make about another person. They're not really comments about the other person. They're comments about ourselves, really. Absolutely. And, uh, so, so, so I think um, I think dialogue certainly is 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 a is a great way uh, of dealing with this. But I think in terms of dealing with this notion of fragmentation and wholeness, when you understand Bohm, you realize that we are not separate. Right, and I think I think that's really the biggest challenge. Right, is those of us who understand that we are not separate, that we're all interconnected, having to interact and, and live with and work with people who do see themselves as very separate and, and that this dialogue um, and film can hopefully you know, bring us together um, from what, regardless of our level of understanding, uh, that would be ideal. Um, 
in the last few minutes that we have, I want to make sure to ask Will, um, you know, the, the question that I asked David, um, David Moody in terms of how BOEM would respond to the crises that we're in right now. Well, you know, that's that's been kind of one of our underlying themes of these events for this community. We went online because of COVID, right? And so uh, it's always in the room with us. It's always in the conversation. So uh, that's been on my mind since watching this film too. And I, I think that um, many of us <laughs> talk about a paradigm shift in one shape way, in one way or another for decades. And I think several of us, many of us recognize what's going on now as a kind of inflection moment uh, for, for some of these shifts to kind of happen in a in a critical, uh, uh, powerful way. And one of those big conversations has been about the Western uh, progression of individualism, the rise of individualism, the distillation of individualism, all the way into our Western movies, right? Uh, but <clears throat> this is seen in physics in the form of the distillation of atomism, increasingly distilled vision of the isolated individual. And every existential philosopher from Pascal to Kierkegaard is speaking in some way about themselves as an estranged, isolated entity, and that this is where their sense of existential anxiety is coming from, isolation, estrangement, right? right? And so as long as we live in a scientific world where the metaphors the sciences are, are, are giving us are atomism, isolation, mm -hmm. we're going to project that back onto ourselves, see ourselves as isolated. So now we're in this huge cultural clash uh, where uh, and it's, it's a little bit of an East meets West thing, too, not to bring that into the room too much, you know, but that's part of what's going on, cultural values, you know, what goes up must collide. Uh, and, and so there is a collision of values of collectivism, of communism and individualism of the Western capitalist democratic system. And so this is a crisis of our times, individualism versus collectivism, wholeness yeah. versus separation. And I think that what Bohm has done is he's put a major emphasis on wholeness in physics. And because science is such an important myth, a grounding myth for our culture, he's actually reworked the grounding myth of our culture by getting, giving us a new set of metaphors to see ourselves as unified as opposed to isolated bits of matter. And so my hope is that as we shift and we lose some of our emphasis on materialistic science and we lose some of our emphasis on individualism and we open up into more perspectives of collective per collectivity, that Bohm's work will become increasingly important uh, in part, just as a mirror for the projection of our integrated selves. And that part about the wave function, is, it's so important because it's not about giving way, losing the individual to the collective or vice versa. He, there's this great line in the film, uh, Paul, where he's talking about electrons, how electrons are free, but they're also working in this coherent cloud. And it gives us this beautiful metaphor for oneness and manyness. And you talked about uh, the wave function. I think, David, uh, uh, the wave function gives us this image of, of everything is one. You know, my dissertation was very much on, uh, actually, my dissertation advisor said, you've got to read David Bohm, it's in blanket order, you know, to, to talk about what you're doing with particles and waves. And uh, what, what I, my main focus is on the fact that all of us, if we were in the same room playing musical instruments and we had one microphone, it would record all the notes we make as one note, as one, as one uh, wave. Waves have no problem with oneness and manyness. The problem, <laughs> we can't lose the individual and the collective. And so it's so important. What, one of the most important things about what he's doing is he's trying to move us towards collectivity while at the same time preserving individuality. He was a rugged individual. At odds with science, at odds with his dad, at odds with the system. And so that's, that's what I hope we take most is, is he's really a role model for this struggle to unify the tensions of individuality and collectivity. And it's there in his science and it's there in his life. That's right. You, you don't have to lose yourself, your individuality to be one of the collective and move forward. Um, we only have a few more minutes and there, there are two questions from our audience that I think are really beautiful and would love to have them addressed. Um, Skylar Fontana is asking, and uh, maybe uh, Taria, you can answer this because you brought up dreams. What do you think David Bohm would have to say about dreams? Well, I, I would like, I, I would love to, conjecture, but does David know what David, what, what Bohm said about dreams? I mean, I, I'm sorry to just pass it along, but. No, that's okay. There's the two questions now, and I'll, I'll let you um, maybe address both. One about Bohm's um, view of dreams, and did Bohm ever, this is Anna's question, address psychedelic experiences in relation to implicate order? Did you want me to, to answer that? Yes, please. Both, both just if you know about what he would say about dreams and if you know what he would say about psychedelic experience. My impression is that 
the dreams and psychedelic experiences were not issues that uh, Bohm addressed at any length or in any depth. My impression is that uh, psychedelics in particular, he would tend to be somewhat suspicious of and uh, suggest that it, it might give uh, temporary insight or feeling of insight, but when the drug wears off, one is stuck back in one's ordinary life. Um, but I'm a little bit speculating here because I think these are subjects that he tended to veer away from, uh, in, in, you know, in favor of uh, dealing with more the actualities of, of everyday life was where his main attention was. Thank you, David. And, and Corinne, we haven't heard from you in a little while, and I know we have a, a, just a tiny bit more time. Well, well, that's rare to not hear from me, but I think, <laughs> yes, as you know, um, anyone who knows me. Um, but, you know, this might be perfect as a wrap-up because um, I really, first of all, I want to thank Paul profusely, not only for making a beautiful film, but it's like two o'clock in the morning. Ah. There he is. I mean, <laughs> though, though we haven't uh, fallen in love with him enough with the beautiful film. And, you know, I'd also want to thank everyone on the panel. David Edmund Mooney has been nothing but a champion and so wonderful, and I've had so many rich conversations with them. Um, Trina, you've done, as always, a, fa a fabulous evening. But I kind of want to leave with a thought. Um, and that is that this is so rich. This conversation, you asked me earlier, what's this film doing? What's the difference it's making? Rich conversation after rich conversation after rich conversation. And uh, bad pun intended, I want to keep the dialogue alive. And I'd like to think, is there maybe a way we could do a weekend around this work up at Pacifica or up at Esalen or places where we could, you know, have whole weekends devoted to this work. We have this amazing book by David, which I put in the chat and I'm, uh, I'm encouraging. We have this beautiful film. Paul has, um, you know, a part two of the film. So I really want to encourage us to see how we could uh, keep this alive. And I want to sneak in one last question because Paul, you did this at the beginning, but I want everyone to hear it. Maybe as a close, you could talk about what's next for the film and how could we stay involved with your work. We want to yes. support you. We're Pacifica. This is not a normal crowd. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I mean, basically, um, you know, one of the big challenges in making this film was what to leave out. <laughs> you know, I mean, because Bohm uh, and actually, you know, you, you, there is a longer version of this film. And I think David Moody at the end of the film, you know, he described Bohm as a universal genius in the, uh, in the longer version of the film, uh, which, you know, people perhaps haven't seen as yet because we're, we're gonna roll it out. But he described Bohm as a universal genius um, uh, in, in the mode of, we'll say, a Leonardo da Vinci, not so much in the mode of a Picasso who was directly um, focused on, on one area, like painting. But David Bohm was interested in the whole, so anything within the whole <laughs> required attention. So he, he was very much a universal genius. So we had a major <clears throat> problem in, you know, what do we leave out of this film? So I made a decision early on that we would park dialogue for the moment and we would concentrate on the physics and the philosophical and the deep spiritual aspects that come out of, uh, of Bohm's work. So uh, we've done that and uh, we're now working on a uh, companion episode which is on Bohmian dialogue. And this in a way will complete, as far as I'm concerned, the kind of Bohmian legacy. But the other thing I'd like to say is that, you know, while I was making this film, um, there was a point in post-production where I actually forgot it was about David Bohm because I became so immersed in his ideas. Yeah. So, so he is a vehicle for the ideas. So the ideas are what's really important. And in a sense, I don't take credit really for the film either. I'm just a vehicle for uh, using my skills as a filmmaker to express ideas. So again, I just say I'm a vehicle for ideas. Um, so the next thing you're going to see will be um, the rollout of the director's cut. And within the next week or two, we're signing a global deal 
for the uh, release of the longer version of the film. So it'll go to streamers, it'll go to territorial broadcasters, and millions of people are actually going to see this work now, which is just uh, an unbelievable honor for me that this is, this is getting out there. And then I'll be moving on to a new project, which we're just putting together at the moment, which is very much about um, relational science, uh, which is, um, again, it's kind of the, the nexus of spirituality and science, but very much from the Eastern mystical uh, uh, perspective um, to, to um, uh, you know, uh, learn about what the mystics knew for millennia, where Western science now is really only beginning to, to, to grapple with. So while the Bohm story was very much, let's say two thirds science philosophy, one third spiritual, the next project will be very much a spiritual project and you know, one third kind of science. It'll all be about relational science and getting beyond the, um, the norms, very much what I postulated towards the end of the Bohm film, um, that, uh, you know, we need to go beyond the old mathematics and the old physics and the old philosophical uh, uh, dogmas and so on, which I believe are obstacles to um, allowing us to access that deeper level of reality. So I'm looking at sort of doing something, a deeply relational science that that takes us to a comprehension, uh, comprehension of new dimensions, way beyond our current models, uh, towards a deeper meaning of what wholeness is all about. So in a sense, the, the springboard for this is Bohm, and no doubt we'll reference Bohm in it, but that's very much the next project. And you know, we're, we're, we're working, beginning to sow the seeds of that right now. Exciting. We're very looking forward great. to that. <laughs> yep. We, well, you, well, you'll have a whole new audience again. So. Well, well, I, well, I think it's very important to keep the continuity now because, you know, I, I've been so surprised at how the audience have um, responded to this film. And it's amazing now that we'll be, we'll be signing a distribution deal to get the film out there. So in a sense, now that I think the film has stirred a kind of an, an awakening in people. I think it's very important now to keep this going, keep this momentum going. And that's Absolutely. very much, I think as a filmmaker, um, this is really what I'll be doing for the rest of my life because, <laughs> um, and, and I just think it's a, it's a wonderful exploration and I just feel so honored and privileged to be able to do it. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to say thank you uh, to all of the panelists who joined us and, and Will and Dana. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Pacifica, uh, for allowing me to be a part of it and to host this platform. Wonderful. Thank you, Trina. Thank you, Trina. You've been brilliant. You're yeah. going to go watch the film a third time now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, Corina, very, very nice to meet you, uh, almost in person. Uh, yes. You've been doing, you've been doing amazing work behind the scenes for the, uh, for the film. And um, so thank, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody. You know, I just feel one of the great things I think about this film that I got to talk to people who actually knew David Bohm. And I think that that really gives the film an organic quality that so, most of the characters who speak about Bohm in the film knew David Bohm. And I think that that really is a great strength in the film. So I just feel so, so privileged to, to have been able to, to do this. Well, thank you so much. And you have multiple guest houses in Ojai for the next <laughs> <laughs> That's the most important thing that came out of this. Thank That's you. right. Thank We're you. convening in Ojai, everyone. <laughs> okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.